Sometimes half just doesn't cut it. Some religious beliefs are like that. You've heard the phrases, maybe even said them. They sound true, like everything happens for a reason, or God won't give you more than you can handle. Love the sinner, hate the sin, or God helps those who help themselves. But when we look at them carefully, we see they are only half true. Join us as we discover the whole truth behind half-truths. Okay. <laughs> I love that ending. <laughs> we are marching through this series. Hopefully you've been with us along the way. Each week talking about uh, a half-truth that we often take as a whole truth, a biblical truth. A lot of them are misnomers, and today is no different. We're exploring these half-truths because the problem is often when we believe them and when we kind of abide by them or when they're said to us, they can often be offensive. They can alienate us from God, confuse us about Scripture, and discourage us. And so it's really important, especially with this phrase, and this is the, the sermon title and the, the phrase that we'll be using, uh, God won't give you more than you can handle. Anybody ever said that to you? And when it's really hard is when you feel like you can't handle whatever you're dealing with. You're in over your head, and it is only discouraging and confusing, isn't it? And so we're going to unpack that a little bit, this idea that God won't give you more than you can handle. And as I've been doing each week, um, sort of reminding us that we live with a lot of these half-truths, many of them innocuous, meaningless. And here's some examples. Did you know, for instance, that a starfish is not really a fish. Yeah, it is actually an echinoderm, an echinoderm. There'll be a quiz later, so write it down. Did you know, and this is kind of weird to me, I didn't, you know, if, if Google is correct, a palm tree is not really a tree, it's a grass. It's kind of weird to me. I'm, yeah, kind of odd. A penny, do you know a penny is worth more than a penny because it takes more than two cents to make it? Which begs the question, why do we have pennies, right? Um, you ever get sick and have those swollen glands? Those glands are not actually glands. They're lymph nodes. Just kind of a half-truth there. They're swollen. Or how about a mountain goat? We don't see many mountain goats in Florida, but apparently, even though it looks like a goat, a mountain goat is not actually a goat. Kind of a half-truth going on there. And then, how many of you like the color pink? Yeah, pink is not actually a color. Um, yeah, go figure that. And here's one that I have kind of figured out, and I may be wrong about this, but I think, I think I'm on to something. If you ever like to go shop at Publix, right, you walk into Publix, and in, in, their, in their lobby, the first thing you see is this ginormous weight scale, right? So all the women look around to be sure no one else is looking. The men don't care. They hop on it, right? And I have this, I have this theory that it, and I've tried this at several Publix. It's the same weight at every Publix. And I've even asked the management if they calibrate the scales. And they swear to me they do. But then I go to the doctor's office. And guess what, guys? I'm five pounds heavier every time. <laughs> every time. Like, they're doing that on purpose. So you think you can buy more when you go into Publix. I think I'm on to something. You try it out. Try it out. I'm serious. <laughs> Half-truths. They're everywhere, right? We live with them everywhere. So let's talk about this one. This is a challenging one, a dangerous one, really. God won't give you more than you can handle. And I want to suggest there are two, two significant problems right out of the gates with this particular half-truth. And, and the first is this. God is not the one who gives you more than you can handle. Stop blaming God. We often do that. God, why are you? God, where are you? You know, and, and the, that's an automatic response to blame God. You know who's to blame for the things that you can't handle? Evil, Satan, and you know what? Sometimes just your, yourself. We get ourselves into these messes. It's called sin, and this is not God's 
deal. Delivering bad things to your doorstep is not God's plan. That's not the way he operates. It's the opposite, in fact. Adam Hamilton, after, whom, after whose book title I took this sermon series title, he said, God will, in fact, help you handle all that you've been given far, far from uh, God not giving you more than you can handle. He'll help you handle all that you have been given. And so what we have to do is we have to turn our perspective around and not blame God, but seek God's help in the middle of that which seems to overwhelm us, which leads to the second problem. And it's the second half of the saying. The problem is that plenty of people are sunk by having more than they can handle. I mean, I think this is just empirical evidence, guys. Look around. Look at your life. Look at those around you. I see people all the time, the death of a child, the betrayal of love, it, it, with mental illness, when it comes to physical abuse or sexual abuse. They're sunk. They're overwhelmed. They are absolutely in over their heads when there's a debilitating disease, when there are broken families, when there's heartbreak or humiliation, when a child suffers cyberbullying, when emotional manipulation happens again and again. The list could go on. That list and so much more that I'm describing, you know what it does? <clears throat> it supports more than half a million mental health counselors in America. Because that's the reality. There is more than we can handle. Four in ten Americans, four in ten Americans go to a counselor. And I want to say right here from this platform that we as Christians should remove any stigma with regard to counseling, therapy of any kind. This is a gift of God, just like going to a doctor or a dentist. It's about being healthy as an individual, healthy in your relationships, healthy in every way. And a lot of people know that. See, the problem is that a lot of these things these, that we encounter that overwhelm us, they can easily lead to sickness or dysfunction, to divorce, to PTSD, to depression, or to suicide. I was absolutely alarmed at looking at some of the statistics around suicide in America. The latest that I found were in 2017, 47,000 Americans took their own lives. 47,000, which is a 33% rise since 1999. Don't tell me that people aren't overwhelmed. It, 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 taking your own life is the second leading cause of death for those under 35 in America. Clearly, people do get overwhelmed with more than they can handle. We need to debunk that phrase. That phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle, is misquoting 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. That's where we're going to dig in here. This is our central text. And before I share the text with you, let me share a little bit of the setting that Paul is speaking into with the Corinthians. These are new Christians. They're baby Christians. And they're, you know, they don't know what they don't know. You've heard that phrase, right? They don't know what they don't know. And they think they can just take on the world because they believe in Jesus now and all is going to be well. But Paul is saying, you know what? You're still kind of affected by your culture and by the religious practices. For instance, in their setting uh, as pagans, they practiced what was called temple prostitution. Um, this was a thing. They had a prostitute on the altar, and the men came out on Saturday night, and that's, you can use your imagination. They also would take food that had been sacrificed on the altar home to eat. And these things, Paul began to say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, you, you, you got to be careful here. You got to be careful here because you are used to these things. They're a part of your culture, and uh, they're going to be a temptation. Don't think that you're above it. Don't think you're beyond it. See, that's, that's always dangerous for us, no matter where we are in our spiritual walk. In fact, there was a phrase, to live like a Corinthian was often synonymous with sexual license and drunkenness. And so he comes to them with this warning. And this is what he says. This is the verse that often gets misquoted. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. The issue is temptation, you see. Not that he won't give you more than you can handle, but he will provide a way out of temptation. 
for you and for me. And so there are three important truths. This is a power-packed verse, just one verse. But there are three things that I want us to affirm that we see that Paul is teaching us. And the first one is just kind of a great recognition for all of us to affirm. And that is that temptation will come is a certainty. Don't fool yourself. He was telling them, and he's telling us, don't fool yourself. Temptation will come in your life. Some struggle, some trial, some issue will affect you. Now, it may be different from one to another. We all have different susceptibilities, don't we? Right? Now, if you take a big, warm piece of apple pie fresh out of the oven and put a dollop of ice cream on it, and you put it in front of my wife, she'll just pass it down. Put it in front of me, I want seconds already. I mean, we all have different temptations in different ways, right? Some people are more vulnerable to alcohol than others are. Um, Now, this is anecdotal, so I may be wrong, but I I tend to think that women are more susceptible to material things. I pulled up this picture of a shoe and showed it to my wife, and she went, oh, my gosh, i got to have it. (laughs) You know, she could pull up any shoe whatsoever, a man's shoe. I'd be like, okay, Ann, what? You know, what do you want? Uh, Whatever. But men, you know, men are more visually tempted and stimulated. I'm not going to elaborate on that so much. But we're all different. We have different temptations, different things that draw us in, suck us in, that affect us. And Paul is saying, don't fool yourself. It's a certainty. My grandmother, she had a saying about what you had to do in life, the, the certainties of life. And this was her saying, the only thing you have to do in life is eat, breathe, pay taxes, and die. As a teenager, I'm thinking, thanks, Grandma. That's really it's great to know. Um, Paul would add to that. He'd say, and it's also a certainty that you will be tempted in some way, in some fashion. So, first thing is that temptation is a reality. The second truth is that no temptation is unique to you. We often feel like what we're going through, no one else has been through. No one's walked down this path. And we feel very isolated and very alone in that. That's a dangerous place to be. Because, first of all, you need to know, regardless of what it is, you're never alone in this. You're not the only one who's had to deal with it. If you feel lonely with a stress or temptation, you become more vulnerable to depression, to high blood pressure, to poor sleep, to compromise mental, physical, and social skills. And so Paul would want to come to you and me leaping out of Scripture and grab us by the collar and say, listen, you're never alone in facing what you're facing. Remember this, because you'll feel that way. But remember this truth. And that means... That God has given us this gift of one another so that we can empathize with one another, walk with one another, share with one another, support one another, pray for one another. And we're going to get more at this. This is a part of how God provides a way, a way out of temptation, which leads us to the third truth. And that is that there's always a way out of temptation. Not most of the time, not some of the time, not 99% of the time, but always a way out. Here's the dealio. You and I don't often take the way out, do we? There's a way out, and we don't take it. Uh, Let me illustrate this. We have this app that I use when we're driving on on the road. It's called Waze. Anybody use Waze? Anybody else? Any Wazers here? Waze is awesome. It's a real-time app where people down the road ahead of you plug in like, oh, hey, there's a police officer hiding. Oh, hey, there's like, you know roadkill on the road or you know, a car on the side of the road or whatever there's and and as well as a gps and little voice and you can program it like you have a little australian accent or british accent oh there is an exit you know 300 feet down the road take a right and about i don't know a quarter of the time she tells me to turn off on that off ramp and my wife looks over and says why didn't you take the off ramp i ooh, oops she was telling me she was giving me an off-ramp, and I passed it by. I did it yesterday, as a matter of fact. And that's the, way, that's the way God is with us, guys. I mean, God gives us a way out. God gives us off-ramps, but we don't often take them, do we? So Paul, he says, remember this. God gives you a way out of whatever is tempting you, whatever it might be. The word, there's one Greek word that he uses for this phrase, a way out. Ekbasin, ekbasin. It's a Greek word, ekbasin. Ekbasin was used to refer to an army that's in a mountainous region under siege. 
and it is surrounded by mountains and by the enemy. It has no way out. Until then, it finds one little escape route. That's at Basin. Oh, a way out, a way out. Uh, we get an English word from this word, basin. Now, you can think of a basin as like a bowl, but there are different definitions for a basin. Another definition is a dry dock. Maybe you've seen this in some ports where they can drain the water to provide a way out of the water for the boats so they can work on them and then flood the water and put the boats back in. That's Ek Basin. God provides a way out. Uh, here's another way of, of understanding it. I, I was thinking about one of my favorite movies of all time, Straw Pole here. Anybody else here seen and like the movie The Scarlet Pimpernel? Oh, man. I'm like two people? You guys are sad. We're going to have a movie night and show you The Scarlet Pimpernel. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's based on a 1905 novel by a guy named Baroness Orksey. I mean, anything written by a baroness, right? And they, it became a, a play that was famous in London around the turn of the century. It, uh, several um, movies made of this. It, it's, set, it's a historical fiction set in the French Revolution. And the aristocrats in France are being killed. They're going to the guillotine. They're being held in prison and being killed day after day during this, what they called the reign of terror. And so... Uh, Sir Blakeney Percy and his comrades are British dudes who put on these really cool disguises and these ornate plans to sneak into France and into the prisons and to rescue these people who are on, the, on death row, basically, to provide an escape route, a way out. That's the image of what our God does. Now, as you think about these you know, these ideas of an off-ramp or a dry dock or this guy helping people escape. I want to give you a little disclaimer because the way out that God provides may not necessarily be about removing the temptation that's in front of you. It may not necessarily be about removing it, but rather the ability to endure it and to, as some as some translations say, to stand under it, to stand under it. See, we often, we often are praying, oh God, take this away, take this away, and then you didn't take it away. What's your problem, God? When all the while, God might be saying, you know, I'm going to give you an ability you never knew you had. I'm going to empower you in the middle of this so that you can see my grace, my light, my power, my love in a different way. You see the difference? We have to change our orientation. Here's the way Craig Barnes puts it. I love the way he put it. Uh, Craig Barnes wrote, Our saving hope is not to be rescued from the dark world, but to live in the darkness by the light of Christ. Do you see the difference? We often pray for that darkness to be removed, but he wants his light to infuse it. It follows, he says, it follows that we can spend less time praying for deliverance from how it is and more time seeking the face of God in every circumstance. See that... He gets at the problem that we're often wanting God to be like, you know, a, a rabbit's foot or Santa Claus. You know, give me this. I want this good luck or I need this or take that away from me. Instead of God, come into this situation with me. You see the difference? Regardless of your circumstances. I want to suggest as we consider this that there are three action steps every one of us can take to try and discern better the way out that God provides. And here are the three action steps. You may want to write these down. They're real simple. And the first one is this. Trust in God's word. That may seem like kind of like a, like a duh, no-brainer. But I mean actively trust in God's word to you. Absorb it, learn it, apply it, claim it. Um, there, in 1988, there were some blind slalom skiers in the Olympics. Now go figure. Blind, think about that. Blind slalom skiers. How did they ski around the obstacles, the slaloms? Um, they had a guide in front of them shouting out when to turn. And they had to listen carefully and trust the word of their guides. If they trusted the word of their guides, they could navigate the challenge in front of them. If they didn't listen to it, it could have been catastrophe. And we're the same way with God. We need to trust God's word to help us navigate the challenges 
the, that which seems to overwhelm us, the temptations, the difficulties in our lives. Now, here's, here's your first opportunity to trust. God's Word tells us this. God tests you and evil tempts you. See, we often assign God with the blame of tempting us. Nowhere in the Bible do you see God tempting people. God tests. It's different. Very different. In fact, here's what James teaches us in James chapter 1, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. That's about as clear as it can be, right? And so we know that the tempter from the very beginning of Genesis was the evil one. And he even tempts Jesus. We call it the, uh, the, the Mount of Temptation in we see in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And so we need to assign blame where it's due and recognize the resource we have in our Lord. Because the truth is, God's Word says, Jesus was tempted and He helps you in your temptation. Here's what that means. It means that by God coming in the flesh and experiencing temptation and suffering because of it, He can empathize Nothing gets past him. Nothing surprises him about what you're going through, number one. But because of his risen, his risen nature and his Holy Spirit, the power of God in you, he actually can empower you and help you. And this is the way Hebrews puts it in chapter 2. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You see how just nuts and bolts practical this is to trust God's word in this way. So that's the, the first action step. And the second one is to connect with God's people. I told you that was coming. Connect with God's people. Because we're not meant to live this spiritual life in a vacuum, just me and Jesus and armchairing it as a Christian. We need one another. God has always spoken through the body. In fact, we get God's Word by the community coming together and discerning what God's Word is to make the Bible what the Bible is. That's God's design. Our faith is not ever, ever private. It's personal, but not private. It's always corporate. It's always communal. We need one another. And devotion to God's people reveals your true identity to carry you through temptation. We need to remind one another of who we are that helps us endure, helps us stand under it. This is what the early Christians did. And they described in the very beginning of the Christian movement, what they did in Acts chapter 2. It says, they devoted themselves, that word devoted, underline that, that word, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's God's word, and to fellowship, relationships, and to the breaking of bread and prayer. This was their habit. This is what they trusted and they connected with one another. And that helped carry them through the difficulty, the challenge, the temptation. When they would forget who they were, they were anchored in their identity through one another. I mentioned Craig Barnes' quote earlier. He tells a story about his grandfather having a kind of prodigal son experience. Apparently, he had multiple generations that grew up on a farm in North Carolina, and he was looking at a, a photo annual of all of these pictures, old-timey pictures on the farm, just like that. And all the fun they were having on the farm and the work and the crops on the farm. You know, his father's father and great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather, all, all on the farm. But then out of this whole photo album of all these farm pictures, there was one picture that stood out was bizarre, and he couldn't understand until he, he got some explanation. It was a picture of his grandfather as a young man in Miami Beach. Now, if you've been down to South Beach, you know it's nothing like a North Carolina farm right? And uh, he had a bit of a frown on his face. And as the story was told, apparently he got tired of this idea that he was, you know, who he was as a Christian, as a farmer in this little community in North Carolina. And he decided to join the circus, so to speak. He actually became a roadie with a band and went all throughout the South, landed in Miami Beach. And he came to realize, you know, this, this kind of life is not all it's built up to be. A lot of lonely nights, a lot of craziness with drugs and alcohol and loose sexual license. And so he came home. He came home. Why? 
because he had been rooted, his identity had been rooted in his family and in his neighborhood and in his church family and through the words of his preacher. And he knew who he really was. He came back to who he really was. That's why you and I need to connect with one another. Because we're all going to go through something that takes us away from who we truly are in Christ. And we need to remind one another. We trust in God's word. We connect with God's people. And the third action step is to serve God's purposes. There is there's nothing more quick, or quicker, quicker is the word, right? Quicker that you can do to make an impact on a struggle or a temptation that you're having than to serve somebody else. Because what it does is it diverts your focus away from yourself. And this is by God's design. This is how God has created us. Despite any temptation, God gives you grace to serve others. We often think of grace as this personal benefit, and it is. It covers our sin. It renews us, restores us, redeems us, all these personal things. But it's more than that. It's like this endowment of energy and power and giftedness that God puts in us and gives us in order to give it to others, in order to serve others. This is the way Peter puts it in 1 Peter. He says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We steward God's grace, which means we're using it in right proportion, not only for ourselves, but for others. And, and so God gives you grace to serve others. Why? Because God's purposes and God's plans are to benefit you. And, and if we know that God has given us this grace and this opportunity to serve others because it's to our benefit, well, then we're going to respond differently to opportunities, aren't we? We're going to respond to the needs of others differently, aren't we? He reminds us of this in Jeremiah 29, 11. You know this verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's the reality of what God wants us to experience and to share with others. That's why tomorrow night I'm doing the shape class. I hope you'll join me for it. It's just a one session deal. It's a part of our next step series. We have uh, different steps where you can go deeper in your walk with Christ through our Discovery 101, our Discipleship 201, and tomorrow night our Shape 301 class. And we're going to talk about your spiritual gifts and understand those more deeply. We're going to talk about what motivates your heart how God really has shaped your heart. We're going to talk about how your abilities and your personality and your experiences all taken together uniquely shape you to make a maximum impact in other people's lives. It's a way for you to experience and to share God's abundant grace that has been given to you through all those different elements of your life that are unique to you. That's what we'll be doing tomorrow night. And I hope you'll join me. See, these are all the positive reasons for us to serve God's purposes. Let me give you one negative reason why we should serve others and serve God's purposes. And this is it. Temptation can lead to spiritual stagnation. You ever been stuck spiritually? Look at the reasons that are surrounding it. You're probably in some struggle. Often if you're in some struggle, some temptation, some trial, you feel like you're just spinning your wheels. Where is God? Who is God? I'm losing my faith. So on and so forth, right? And the antidote is to serve God and others, to put literally put action to the stagnation, to be useful. I, I'm told this story about a guy named Niccolo Paganini. I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly. He was a famous violinist who donated this famous violin to the city of Genoa. And, uh, but his stipulation was that it would be put in this sort of airtight, little case and never used and ironically when a violin is used it wears more kind of evenly but when it's not used it tends to fall apart more quickly when it's not being useful and I think it's just a, an amazing analogy for us in the Christian life when we let God use us when we serve God's purposes 
we tend to find God's grace coming alive in us and through us even more. Serving others, listen to this, serving others may be one of God's tests for you. Remember, the devil tempts God tests. Ask yourself the question, where am I serving God? Very purposely, very intentionally, where am I serving others in the name of Jesus? That may be one of his tests for you. And remember, God will always provide a way out of the temptation. God gives the test. Satan is the tempter. But God always gives us a way out. And this table today is a reminder, a reminder of how God has given us an ultimate way out of sin, death, evil, all the darkness that seems to dominate our lives, right? It's a symbol of the death of Jesus, a symbol of his giving of his life so that you and I might have life, so that we're not captured by the darkness, so that we're not defined by sin. We have his identity, his life empowering us, his grace motivating and working through us. All of that is a part of what this table represents for you and for me. And so as we come to this table, as we take bread and cup, and as you taste it, you're tasting a symbol of what God wants to do to to energize and empower you with His plans, with His purposes, and with His grace. This is not my table. I'm not the host, nor is it the table of Stuart Congregational Church. This is the the Lord's table. Jesus is the host, and he welcomes you if you want to taste and see that the Lord is good, if you want to receive his riches of grace, to come and be part of this holy sacrament. Let's pause now for a moment of prayer. We are so humbled and grateful that you do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, O Jesus, that you love us so deeply. We can't begin to put words to the depth of your love for us. We ask, O Lord, that you would meet us where we are. Whatever the struggle is, whatever the temptation, whatever the trial is, wherever we're stuck, help us, O Lord, to have the faith, the courage, and to take the action needed. And maybe it's beginning here and now, coming forward to this table with meeting you in a new way. Help us to hear your voice, to feel your touch, to be filled by your spirit so that we might become alive as never before in and through you. We lift up all the needs that we represent here, all the pains, the fears, the struggles, the regrets, the sins, the failures. We, We put them all in your hands. And we thank you that you give us that option. We thank you. And so hear this prayer in all of our prayers, even as we pray like you taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we gather at this table today, let me remind you of the words of Jesus. We call it the words of institution. The last words he spoke in the upper room. As the disciples gathered around the table with him, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. In the same manner that evening, pouring from the fruit of the vine. He said, this is the cup of salvation, the cup of the new covenant, shed for the remission of your sins. Drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So friends, we feast on this, the riches of God's grace, with great joy and thanksgiving and hope and grace in our hearts. I'm going to invite you to come forward to the table in just a, a couple of minutes. Let me say a couple of things, words of instruction. One is that the band and tech team will come forward first, and then they'll lead us in worship. And, and as, as, as we're going through communion time, feel free if you want to sit or stand, to pray or sing. Let it be a worshipful time to encounter the living Lord 
in our midst as we share in this holy sacrament together. Uh, I'll invite you to come forward down the center aisle and, and just make a line and, and you'll receive the cup and the bread. And we, as you take the bread out, just dip it into the cup and then partake of it. And uh, then you'll take a seat around your side aisle. If you, if you have a need for me to bring the elements to you where you're seated, just stay where you are and I'll bring those to you. The bread is gluten-free also, so you can be assured of that. This is the table of the Lord, and He welcomes you to it with open arms of grace and love. Let us now come to the table.
God like you, a love so true, there has never been. God like you, a love so true, there has never been, there will never be, a God like you, a love so true, there has never been, there will never be, a God like you, a love so is experienced partly in his body he gives us one another to worship together to learn and grow together to serve together and to lean on one another we need one another this is God's design for experiencing his greatness his love his grace his provisions in the middle of struggle and temptation listen if if there's something you're dealing with maybe there's a difficulty in your life or maybe there's someone else on your heart and mind or maybe you have questions about the faith or about our church, whatever it is, we invite you to come forward immediately following the service. We, we have one of our Stephen ministers available, Holly DeSantis. Holly will be over here next to the piano. Please don't hesitate to come forward and see Holly. If you'd like a moment of prayer, a sounding board, someone to walk with you through something that's happening in your life, um, Holly will be here to pray with you at that time. Don't hesitate to see her. Next week, next Sunday begins Holy Week. It's an incredible time in the life of the church. It begins with Palm Sunday on Sunday. It's going to be a, a wonderful time with a procession of palms. 
And then Maundy Thursday. Guess what day of the week that is? Yeah, Thursday. Maundy Thursday. We'll be gathering here on Thursday evening for an appetizer potluck. That's a week, not this week, but the following week. Um, and then we'll have a communion service following that. And then our Good Friday service at midday on Good Friday, which is, of course, on Friday. Um, that Thursday night, we'll have a glow-in-the-dark Easter egg hunt for the kids after the Monday Thursday service. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll have uh, Easter egg hunts after each service. So if, if you have kids or grandkids that really want to score, there are three egg hunt opportunities during Holy Week here. So get ready for that. And I tell you all this now to say this. Listen, people, people will, who will not come to church all year will accept an invitation for Easter Sunday. Be thinking and praying about who you might invite to come with you. Think about Holy Week, being here with us through that week and inviting someone to be with you on Easter Sunday so that they might encounter the transforming power, love, and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, along with you and along with us. Okay? Let's all pray about that. And now, beloved, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you. May the light of the Lord's countenance shine upon your face and give you peace. Go now in peace in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and all God's children said, amen. Hey!